Are you a business leader looking for next? I was. Are you an athlete transitioning to next? I wasn't. If you're looking for your next, this is the space for you. This is the Business Athlete Performance Lab. Hi, I'm Keith Billis, and this is Live in the Lab. All right. A little bit of weirdness in front of the camera there for anybody who's watching. Because I'm like, hey, where's the button? Where's the button? I can't get it going. How did you go viral on TikTok? You were on America's Got Talent. How much did you get paid to be on AGT? Oh, you didn't get paid. Keith and Steve here in Live in the Lab. You're a great interviewer. I love it. 48 miles, 48 hours. And not just once. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> I hit 50 last time, and I'm like, yeah, things are a little She's different than they were 10 years ago. So trust me, things are to keep. You have no time for the BS that much yeah. of society seems to put on the table. Why is that? Like, what you're talking about is real right now. There's just no bullshit here, but it's just real. We brought you in with some Marley. I said, Joseph, let's talk music for a second. You said, well, Keith Oldies, 60s, 70s, and 80s. I've never talked to a sir before. Why are you a sir? In many ways, we're the same story. I came from nothing. <laughs> You came from nothing. I think the old saying goes that if you want a trophy, you climb Everest. If you want respect, you climb K2. I've built an AI myself, and it's pretty fascinating when you can have a conversation with yourself with your own knowledge. Have you done that before? Why are we rushing to make these tools if they're all they're going to do is hurt humanity? Does the world need an Oppenheimer moment with AI? What a fun show. Boom! It's Monday. It's Monday. And I'm live in the lab, kicking off another week. Great shows lined up for us. Hey, did you catch the memo? We're now at minus six GMT. No more minus five. So if you're listening somewhere around North America, we're on the central standard time zone. A little bit of funk bringing us today. The central time zone, minus, minus five GMT. We're now minus six. I gained the next hour of sleep. You notice... Had to turn the lights up today, make myself look a little younger. Nah, I just got more sleep. That's what I got. What a weekend it was. Man, we're supposed to have rain all weekend. Freezing rain here in Manitoba, Canada. We got a little bit of it. Just a little bit. Winter's on the on the visceral edge of our province right now, of our city. It's just right over, just, just over there. It's teasing us. It's here. It's almost here. Kind of here. Regardless, big show today. Is it ever not a big show? Hey, to, to, to all, the, all the new people watching and listening, thank you. Some of you have been reaching out to me over on the old texts, over on the old emails and the old socials and saying, hey, really loving the show, really digging what you guys are doing over there. We're digging it too. I, I always say, we're here to entertain and inform. Well, here's the entertaining part. Oh, Keith's doing his monologue. When's he going to get to the guest? Ah, don't worry. We'll have lots of time for the guest. I got a few things I got to say. It is, uh, it is no month, by the way. What? Yeah, no month. Come on, you know, you're listening. And some of you that reached out to me, some of you, some of you new fans, fans, is that what, is that what you are? No, no, no. We're going to call you Bapletes. You're all athletes, business athletes. You're part of the business athlete performance lab. So that's what you are. You're all athletes. You're not fans. You're athletes, not Swifties. What's Drake fans? Aubrey's? Drake's? I don't know. To all you athletes out there, thank you. Thanks for jumping in, joining, making the show what it is, and, and giving me the feedback we need to keep making this show better. The show's for you. The show's for, for all of you. So if we're not here entertaining and informing you, you're not going to tune in. So if you have ideas for improvement, let us know. We're trying to do the best we can. We know who our audience is. All you business leaders looking for next. All you athletes looking for next. We don't talk retirement here in the lab. Nope. No retiring going on here. New word. It's called transitioning. Yep. Yep. We don't talk retirement, we only talk transition because that's what we help you do. We help you get from over here to over here and find your next through some transitioning. Introducing structure, introducing accountability, introducing sustainability. And along the way, we say no in the month of November. Yeah, I mentioned it a few moments ago, no. No to what? Well, last Wednesday I said no to peanut butter. And I made it through the weekend. So all of you, that have taken the pledge, all former guests, 
and upcoming guests, Matt Shoup. November. November's here, the month of no. Say no to a poison. Just make a better choice. Not asking you to change your life. Maybe transition to a new one. But just say no. Make different decisions. Maybe you'll put the peanut butter aside. Maybe you put the chocolate down. Maybe you'll put the salt down. And we're going to ask the same question of Matt Shoup coming up here in a few moments. But before we go any further, I invite you to head on over to inside.bapple.ai. That's inside.bapple.ai. And why are you going to do that? Because I want you to pop your email address into that form that's on that page. Subscribe to our newsletter so that we can start informing you of cool things that are happening in the lab. Our ambition is to get you on our list and not spam you. No, not spam you. Just help us start building that community so we can start giving you things, showing you things that will add value to your life. So head on over to inside.bapl.ai and throw your old email address in there and it's a good way for us to stay in touch. A great way for us to stay in touch. And along the way, subscribe to the YouTube channel. As we know, that helps pay the bills. Inside.baffle.ai. It's uh, the Business Athlete Performance Lab newsletter. We send out a weekly recap at the end of every week. So if you missed any shows, boom, one email in your inbox. You got them all. That's it. All right. Why don't we... Uh, stop chitter chattering and get at her and move our conversation and our attention to the left but before we do that why don't we introduce our next guest the author of happy baby we know how much i love doing happy baby matt's going wait a minute it's not happy baby keith it's painted baby oh i know matt i know it's painted baby but the audience you see matt's not going to forget the intro now because they're thinking of the happy baby pose come on all you athletes all you business leaders you guys ever done happy, baby? Give it a shot. It's a great, great way to keep that low. Matt? What's happening? I hit ending on the intro too early and I brought you in, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Little technical errors never hurt anybody every now and then. How's it's it going? Good. Welcome to the lab. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really pleased you're here. Now, it's November. I'm going to get right into it. I've taped up my peanut butter and what you peanut missed in butter. my, in, it, I tipped, yeah. you know, what you missed in my intro was I, uh, a little rumor has it, somebody's addicted to M&M peanut butter, peanuts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're going to write that down on the list for me, Matt, November, you're going to write them off. You're going to say, nope. I, no. I was just going to say, yeah, what, what, what would I give up? I could, I could do that. Could you do that with me? I robbed, I robbed my kids Halloween candy. So they come back from trick or treating and then my, my son didn't even go. It's probably my daughter's one of her last years. And I was like, give me the peanut, give me the peanut M&Ms. <laughs> I was just going to ask you, I'm going to say, Matt, so last Wednesday was Halloween. How did you make up with those m and peanuts? I took as many as I could. I yeah. made out very well. Yeah. Of course you did. Yeah. 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 So this year we went with, uh, with the big candy bars, less so than the little ones. And dad was the guy handing out the candy bars. So dad was happy this Halloween because dad had lots of full-size candy bars to eat. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So Matt Shoup, you join us from where today? I'm in Loveland, Colorado. Loveland, Colorado. And just yeah. so the audience knows, it is not Matt Shoup. I was, I was corrected before. I'm going to start it now. It's Matt hey. Shoup. <laughs> Shoup, right? Shoup. Yep, Shoup. Oh. Like shout except with a P instead of a T. Yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. It's shout instead of shout. Okay. I got it. I got it. And then the second thing I will, I will correct myself. Cause I don't know if I did the best job correcting it in the intro is that uh, it's not to my children's disdain, a happy baby. <laughs> it is painted baby. Painted baby. Yes. Yeah. Maybe we could read painted baby while we're doing happy baby though. We could, we could. So let's get into painted baby and the other books in a second, but let's tell the audience more about Matt shout. Yeah, no, thanks for thanks for having me. You know, I um, when I when I jump on a podcast, I share very simply, I love what I do every day. Um, I get to wake up and hang out with really cool people, a lot of a lot of business owners, a lot of men in the business ownership space, a lot of faith based men, and they're just trying to make their life better and make the people around them better, which makes their business better. So uh, I've got a really just unique and diverse background of lots of different passions and adventures that have really combined into a couple of businesses that we that we have here in town. So um, I have a residential painting and roofing contracting company. We own uh, co-own a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Academy. So I teach self-defense 
um, to men, women, children. And I focus primarily on working with kiddos. And uh, then I do some real estate, do some real estate investing, and then I help people buy and sell. But what I'm really excited about working on right now is, is just my books and my speaking. Um, I take leadership adventures to Spain. So I bring business owners, business leaders over to Spain for once in a lifetime adventures and get to drink coffee and hang out with really cool people like you all day. And it's fun. So you're not busy. You're just kind of hanging out. Oh, I'm you know, sometimes busy, sometimes hanging out. It's, it's really interesting. I just had a conversation with my wife this morning. She's like, what's your day look like? And I said, well, other than this like HOA meeting tonight, which nobody looks forward to just hanging out with cool people all day. She's like, well, you're gone from us all day, but it's, it's not work for me, mm -hmm. but it's definitely work for my family. So just understanding when to turn it off is, is important. How do you do that? Just have to do it sometimes. I mean, it was hard for me for a really long time. It's just no matter, no matter how efficient, how many assistants, how much AI, whatever that is, like you're going to get, you got to get to a certain point of the day and say, I'm just done today. And, and there's still going to be more to do. I'm a visionary. So there's always 37 more ideas right in front of me. And you just, you just have to turn it off and be okay with that. You said I'm a visionary. Yeah. Is, is that something you knew you have been or is that something you had to be told through the kobe index or did you just meet with justin breen no i mean as a as a kid i always thought outside of the box and had ideas for things and, and would go try things i mean i got kicked out of like the typical sit down shut up school environment and you know started my first business when i was nine started a little lawn mowing business and i i just remember the first time somebody saying hey you're a visionary it was two to three years into my painting company. I'm like, hey, here's where I want to take this. Here's where I think this can lead to for the people here with the company, for the community. And somebody's like, hey, you're a visionary. And I never had heard that before. Um, but yeah, I was, I was told that by a business mentor years ago. And when you were told that, it gave you the confidence to express it yourself. Because it takes confidence to say that sentence yeah. out of your own mouth. It, it does. And then just understand what it was, because I'd, I'd have a lot of people say, dude, you're crazy. Do you ever slow down? You're, you're busy. You're highly caffeinated. You know, do you, do you never see your family? I'm like, I see my family a lot. Like we enjoy a lot of time together. And it was almost, you know, for a long time, just the typical culture and environment of, you know, go to school, get a degree, get a job, go work for somebody, uh, retire at 59 or 65 or whatever it is. I just never fit into that mold. So I was seen a lot as an outcast. But when I started running into other people that were the same way, they're like, no, this is a, this is a good thing. Lean into that, express that more, be that more, spend more time with those kind of people. That was really life changing. It was really business changing. And um, I don't see it, you know, I, I see it as a superpower. There, there's certain things about it that can be frustrating for others that, that I lead. Um, so we work a lot through that on a daily basis, because uh, you can't just go share all your ideas all the time. Like if I took what was here right now and laid it out for everybody that's in here in the building working, they'd, they'd go run and scream. And talk, talk about that because, <laughs> because uh, actually, can I just get some coaching for a moment? Talk about that because I, I have yeah. learned how to slow down what's going on in this head. Because if everybody, if everybody around me heard what's going on in this head, they would run and scream as well. Yeah, I think for the, you know, for the visionary is um, some of like the key, the key attributes and just things that I go through every day is like, so I'm going to give you a perfect example. I just wrapped up hiking. Uh, I took seven men over to Northern Spain and we hiked the Camino de Santiago. We did the yeah. last 70 miles. Yeah. Uh, it was six days, it was an amazing adventure. It was made for businessmen who wanted to unplug and disconnect and just learn about where they're going and where they're at. And I, I came up with the idea to take these guys here January or February of, of this year, mm -hmm. started floating it out to people. And then by September, there's seven of us walking the Camino, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're in it, we're doing it. And in that process, my wife's helping me execute on things. So mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm sitting, getting ready to, to get all of the materials, all of the content ready for this. And, and I'm already talking about like what the next one's going to look like. So for the, to say the executor or the person that's really X's and O's, the implementer of my wife in this example, she's like, Matt, I'm trying to finish the, the challenges and the surprise experience itinerary and, and get all of these things ready for what you're about to go do in a couple of weeks, right? In September. And you're already talking about what the next one looks like in June of 2024. And it's, it just, it short circuits somebody that's trying to implement that vision to put the X's and the O's in. So um, what's really cool is when a visionary can get with another visionary, 
you know, go have a coffee, go have a beer, go cast your vision and share your crazy 10 year down the road ideas. But the people that have to execute on those, they, their, their brains work differently, right? The implementer, the executor, the, the X's and O's logistical person that takes the vision and makes it happen. You can't interrupt their process to share what you've got six months down the road. That, that could be an eternity for them. Like that could be another lifetime of distance away for them. And it's just knowing when to, when to turn that off. Um, but then we as visionaries need spaces to get excited in. Because we literally touched down. So we touched down from the Camino. I'm second day into this six day hike. I look at the guy next to me. I go, hey, your son could do this hike. He's 12. And I took my son on this hike two years ago when he was 13. So we, we decide two days into the Camino, <laughs> right? Um, that we're going to do a father son one in June. So I get back and what am I excited about? Like, I, I didn't even debrief on how the trip we just did went. I came home and I just like threw up on my wife. Here, here's what this one's going to look like. And she's like, how did this one go? You're, we're just, we're always moving faster than a lot of other people can keep up with. You're living life. Yeah. Yeah. You're actively living life. Like you're proactively yes. living life and you're, and you're, and you're yes. teaching others how to proactively live. Yes. Many, many yes. just re, I would suggest you many just react and just kind of go through life. No, they absolutely do. They, uh, they let life happen to them right? yes. instead yes. of going out and being intentional about things. And there's, you know, there's things you can't control. There's going to be things that, that happen. Of course. Um, but I think the, the mindset it's, it's difficult for me. And this is part of what I do, right? I like to get around people and get them inspired and excited to, know who they are, know where they've come from, know the value their story has and what they want to do and where they want to go and who they want to serve with it. And, um, you know, when somebody says, yeah, but I can't do that. And, and they put up those roadblocks, those are very overcomable. Um, you know, cause I, I started with nothing, you know, saw in the intro, I started with nothing. I had some cards stacked against me growing up and, you know, I shouldn't be here uh, on paper. I shouldn't be here on a podcast with you talking about any kind of business leadership manhood success uh, based on where I was, you know, 25, 30 years ago. Matt, take our audience back 30 years ago, then open the door. Tell us your story. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for letting me do that. I was I already alluded to I was the troublemaking kid in school. So I'd get some math and I'd finish the math in like three minutes because my brain was just firing all over the place. And I'm like, you're going to give me more schoolwork. They're like, nope, that's all we got today. I'm like, well, fine, I'm going to go WWF jump off the chairs and, and play <laughs> like I'm I'm Hulk Hogan you know and and hanging out with my buddy so we're getting we're getting in trouble and I got a lot you know why can't you just sit down and behave and do what you're told you're always talking you're always telling stories you know you're always talking stop talking and um, I'd get I had a little chair in the principal's office so that was you know I caught this label growing up and that kind of to a certain degree became my identity and I grew up in New Jersey so we moved from New Jersey to Colorado to Loveland. So I've been here since I was 10 years old. And that summer, I asked my parents for $200 to buy a boombox. This is when compact discs just came out. And you know, all the kids had boombox, you go to Radio Shack, and they were like 200 bucks. So my parents said, No, sorry, you make $4 a week cutting our grass. Uh, if you want to work all year and do that, you know, go ahead. And I said, Well, that's too long. I don't want to wait that long. They said, find out a way to make your own money. Like, well, let me use the lawnmower. So I just knocked up and down the street, knocked doors and landed little lawn mowing accounts. And I made a couple thousand bucks over summer between fourth and fifth grade. And like that moment for me was that realization. So I'm totally out of the school environment. I'm in a new living environment geographically. And I'm like, hold on a minute. All this stuff they said to me growing up about you know, never gonna amount to anything troublemaker. I'm like, I wanted a boom box. I made $200. I made more than that. So you can work hard, set a plan, have a vision, execute on a goal and get what you want. So that became a real deep rooted part of my identity. I found a sense of purpose and certainty and value in that. And, you know, that's my initial origin story, entrepreneur story, right? So I had a couple thousand bucks in a little fishing tackle box in my bedroom, you know, through middle school. And how old were you when that light went on? It was like 10. Yeah. It's right, 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 right. Turning 10 right there. Yeah. It's interesting to hear you say that because I reflect upon, you know, just my youth, I was selling caterpillars and jars or rocks and jars trying to figure out how to make money. And I look at people yeah. that, that, that do it at that age. And when you learn that you can do it, 
school becomes secondary, doesn't it? It's like it's school becomes a cultural I have to go do. Yeah, it was. For for me, looking back on school, you know, I didn't I didn't hate school because I, you know, I made I made some friendships. I definitely struggled with just a lot of um, identity and confidence. I got I got bullied a lot growing up. I had the uh, you know, Cartman sister from South Park. I had the big headgear and the buck teeth and just very kind of wonky and not confident. But when I got into that business space, totally, totally different mats. So I would say, you know, I went to school, got the grades, got great grades, mm -hmm. but it was, it's like, let's get it done as efficiently as possible. I don't care if I retain or actually learn anything. And then let's get out to do, to do business. Um, you know, another big passion of mine that I found throughout school that, that I really just enjoyed was Spanish, just the Spanish language, engaging with people, speaking Spanish, um, you know, helping in the capacity of translating for families at like a local elementary school. So like my senior year of high school, you have to take one class. So I took my college composition. We went and did weight training as an elective, like what a tough year, right, of school, uh, write a paper, go lift weights, and then go hang out and help at the elementary school. And they had me mostly translating there at the school, which was really fun. So let's keep going on your journey. And I want to explain yeah. why. So my audience is guys that are transitioning, Matt. Guys mm -hmm. that are, you know, waking up one day in their life, probably in their mid to late 30s, somewhere in their yeah. 40s, early 50s going, hmm, all right, so I've been doing this forever. What am I going to do next? Or they've lost their job or they're waking up looking in their own mirror without a loss of identity. Retired yeah. athletes, retired athletes. Yes. The guys here, Dale Weiss, who's played hockey since he was five years old, wakes up at 32 going, where did my team go? Mm -hmm. Right. So Matt, let's continue your journey. And yeah. because you, you're, you're, you're probably relatable to a lot of guys that are listening to this right now. So you were kind of the, I don't want to use the word troublemaker, but you were the, you were the kid. Oh, in, was, yeah. <laughs> so you're the troublemaker in yeah. school who, uh -huh. who, who had a talent to make money. You started making money. You learned that the business light went on at 10, 10 years old. Now let's keep going down that journey. Spain, so you learned Spanish, yeah. and then when yeah. did, when did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu come in? When did the family come yeah. in? And when did you start yeah. with that hundred bucks? Get mm -hmm. ME painting. Yeah, so the big you know the big transition, kind of the next step chronologically, was I yeah. I made it through school, graduate high school, and everybody's going to college at that time. I didn't know what I wanted to do. That's just what everybody did. So as much as I was you know rebellious and a rule breaker, I'm like, well, I'm going to go to college. Um, start taking some of the basic classes there. And I got approached one morning by a college painting company. They came into one of my early morning classes and they said, hey, we've got a summer internship. You get to learn about sales and marketing and business and running a business. And I'm just boom, boom, all the lights are firing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so fill out this card if you're interested. I had no idea what it was. Like I could have been selling encyclopedias. Like I had no idea. I filled this card out and I go through their recruiting process. And literally a month later, I'm spring break, you know, knocking on doors, learning about business. And it, it kind of took me back to those roots of being a kid. So I worked for four years while I was at Colorado State University with this college painting company and uh, made, made a bunch of money, made like six figures over four years. Then I just share that because I spent way more than I made. And that, and that kind of lines me out to, um, you know, one semester I, I go to Spain to go do a study abroad program. And that's where I just completely fell in love with, with Spain. It's a, it's a huge part of my life. We'll talk more about, uh, but I get back from Spain. I meet my wife in the basement of a bar. That's our love story. Um, she did not fall in love right away. It took her way longer. You know, I was like, boom, head over heels and um, yeah, graduate. And I'm not going to stay in the painting business. It's not sexy. It's not glamorous. You know, it was a college thing. So I get into the mortgage business just because it looked, it looked sexy. And I keep saying this because like the optics were really important, that appearance of, you know, how am I going to appear? And I think guys in transition, right? Listeners in transition, that's just like park that because that's going to be one thing you've got to deal with. So anyway, I, um, I start suit and tie mortgage mat working at a local conservative bank, like hating life. I'm married at this point, coming home every day. I've got an over leveraged condo. And um, just not enjoying what I'm doing every day. And I'd come home every day, tell Emily how much I'm just ready to leave and quit this, this job. And one day I get called in, there's a new bank president. He calls me into his office and I go, hey, you know, I'm Matt, nice to meet you. And he leans back in his big banker's desk and like, he doesn't extend the hand. He says, go get all your shit, put it in a box, get out, you're fired. And kick me out of the bank. Whoa. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 
yeah, it was not, you know, it was not kind. It was not. I'm not laughing um, at you. I'm just kind of. Exactly, no, no, it's, I it's wasn't yeah, laugh away. I was no, I wasn't expecting that was always going to was going to be part of the story. Yeah, it was it was, um, you know, and I'm gosh, I'm 23, you know, and I'm still really angry from a lot of the part of my story. So another thing yes. to park about optics, but like you, you will only be as healthy in your transition to to in and out of business, whatever it is, as you are personally. Yeah. And like my default knee jerk was F you, I'm going to fight you, you know, so yeah. said some words to the bank president, <laughs> like got my stuff, put it in a box. And I'm ha and I'm happy now. Like I'm super happy that it happened. You know, yeah. I've really been able to turn anger into appreciation yeah. for the story. But at the moment, I'm like, dude, I got no money coming in. I've got six figures of debt and about a 12 minute car ride home to let Emily know, hey, um, yeah, got fired today. She goes, why are you home early for lunch? Did you get a did you get a long lunch? I'm like, permanent lunch. <laughs> Freaking guy fired me. Um, yeah, and and I had literally Emily's making like eight hundred dollars a month working part-time at an adult respite care facility. And she's like, hey, um, do you want me to start working more? Like we're, we're wanting to plan a family soon. So that was that was the goal. And I go, no, I'll figure this out. And um, on the way home, before I told her I was fired, I called a couple painters that I worked with during the college painting days. I'm like, hey guys, um, what are you doing this summer? They're like, well, you know, we, we don't work as much now since you're in the banking thing. They're like, how's the banking thing going? Mortgage, Matt? I'm like, well, they're like, they fire you. Is that why you're calling? Go, yep, they fired me. And I said, give me like 30 days and I'll have a bunch of work for you guys. And I really was just planning for that to be a transition. I said, I'm just going to make some money, you know, float some, some financial space till I figure out what I want to do. But then when we launched the company, I mean, I went out pretty gangbusters and we pulled in like half million dollars of top line residential paint contracts back in 2005. And it was very profitable. So wow. you know, I got to the end of that year and I'm like, you know, screw the optics because um, I'm looking at some money in the bank. This is kind of kind of cool. And this can support your family. In other words, screw the optics. I don't need the suit. I don't need the 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 the, the white collar appreciation of what all that means. Yeah. I'm making cash over here as a painter. Mm -hmm. Judge me all you want. Sure. Really, yeah. right? That's really what it because I think that is mm -hmm. That's a struggle for a lot of people. I don't want to be a painter. I don't want to be a guy who is a lawnmower. I had I don't know if you know the name Brian Clayton. We had Brian Clayton on a few a few years a few weeks ago. Brian took twenty bucks a lawnmower and turned it into the, you know, the Uber of lawn care in the United States, right? Love so that. yeah, very very similar. You know, very similar. But you know, you took a hundred bucks and turned it into a very profitable growing painting company. Yeah, and people and, that are listening yeah. to this, Matt, are going ah, but you're going no nah, no. Nah, go check my bank account. <laughs> Yeah. Go, and I mean, I just, um, I interviewed a gentleman on my podcast. He's a good friend of mine here in town. Like uh, he's in law enforcement. You know, I got a huge heart for, for law enforcement and yes. he'd been in the, in the business like 17 years and he's just like ready to be done. He goes, I'm going to start a junk hauling business, but I make a hundred and some odd thousand dollars a year at the department here. Plus I get a car, get all the benefits. And he goes, I don't know how I'm going to bump out of that. Two months into a junk hauling business, like picking up people's crap, taking it to the dump he replaced his income at the mm -hmm. police department and then turned it in. You know, I've got a guy right now who's also another police officer. Uh, he's a photographer and he's getting ready to make that transition. And he's about halfway to the income that he needs, but he's doing zero marketing. So it's like, hey man, just make a plan to fill in that gap. Yeah. And again, we'll talk more about that on the, just the, the executable steps for people that are transitioning. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's fun. I mean, it's been a really, it's been a really fun story. I mean, my story, I really believe gets to help people wherever, wherever they're at. I, it, it's clear that it does, Matt. It's clear that it does. So during your story, you started a family as your business was yeah. growing. Yeah. Now, how did you manage the challenges of running your business, mm -hmm. uh, taking care of your own mirror, being a family man? You said something a few moments ago, you know, your Emily says, you know, would you like me to pick up some extra hours and do this and do this? And with all respect, your pride got in the way and you said, no, I'll take care of it. Right. So it's like, yeah. is that a pride thing? Yeah. Is that a teamwork thing? But what strategies, Matt, what principles do you have in place that ensured both your business, your family thrived? Because I can tell you're a family man. It's very clear to me you're a family yeah. guy. Yeah. No, and, it, and it's huge. And I mean, that took a lot of learning and prioritizing and being called out where I wasn't doing it well. Um, and I, man, I, I hate, um, like I host a podcast. I hate when the guests come on and they talk about how awesome they are. I think some of the biggest lessons are in the failures and the screw ups. And oh, I would say man. early, like 
early on, I was, I was awful at that. It was sun up to sundown to like, we got to work. We got to, it was that hustle, hustle, you know, sleep when I'm dead kind of a thing. And yeah, like that built the business. There's a time for that. But I, you know, I remember one day within the first two years of the business, Emily's like, Hey, she's like, I'm over here. Remember me? Mm-hmm. Just, just like that, that little thing right there. So, you know, some of the lessons that I've learned is if, if you are transitioning, if you are in a job right now and you hate it and you're going to leave it, or you just got told to put all your stuff in a box and leave and you're fired and you're like without income, um, there's a there's a window that you have to determine with your family, right? Your spouse, your kids, whatever that family dynamic looks like. You say, hey, I'm going to start a business. I'm going to or change career paths for the next six months. I'm working 12 hours a day or 15 hours a day. And is this okay? So I, I found that there's this whole balance thing. Like nothing's ever balanced. There's seasons, but communicating those seasons. Like this summer was a wild summer. It was It was way too much. And we knew going into it, it was going to be a wild summer. And we knew coming out of it, we'd, we'd get some some rest and some peace. But we just had to set that dynamic. And, and it was crazy. So just being intentional with your time and then knowing if you're going to be short time on the family, you've got it, you've got to make it back up because you can't you can't keep that. You know, I know a couple of hustle and grind guys that are divorced now and their kids hate them and don't talk to them. They've got lots of millions of dollars. Um, but in, in exchange for what? Yeah. So I've, I've been through divorce. I've talked about it on this show. Uh, I've been through building a company, successfully selling a company and going through that entire journey, Matt. Um, mm-hmm. I say that because I, it's it's relatable to my audience. And, and I've learned along the way, the more I express my failure, the more I'm a superhero. Yes. Right? Think about yeah. that, right? And Absolutely. it's really yeah. interesting because you look at Batman, you look at Spider-Man, you look at, you look at uh, Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne had his fallacies, right? Peter Parker had his fallacies, yes, right? But, yes. but when they put their costume on, they were superheroes. Well, mm-hmm. when I get behind the mic talking to my audience or go, you go talk to, you know, the athletes out there or talk with my kids, you become the human. I think you become an even bigger superhero to those people. No, absolutely. And, and you just get to connect with people on a different yes. level. Cause I, cause, and this is, you know, a big core part of painted baby is in the business space. I mean, I remember the first time, like I'm a little bullied kid in New Jersey and getting my butt kicked on the playground and I got buck teeth and headgear and like, and then some little old lady pays me $20 to cut her grass. Okay. A little bit of confidence, but I mean, I'm sitting here at like 23, 24, we've built a, a million dollar company in like three years. Right. So a million dollar company. Yeah. No, thank you. And I'm like, join the million dollar, you know, entrepreneurs club, entrepreneurs organization. Right. Nice. And I'm, I'm running around with all these guys. I'm like, I still don't even realize all the crap that I'm carrying. It's just, a, I'm still like, I'm still a kid. My brain's not fully formed. Right. I'm, yes. I'm 24. And um, just being able to like process through all of that in, in the journey. I mean, I was young, I was arrogant. Nobody could tell me what to do. I, I caught this injection of, of success and it's like, it doesn't matter, dude. It didn't matter how much I scheduled intentional time with my wife. I just didn't have some stuff figured out about what it really means to, to be a man um, just in lots of different capacities. So, I mean, I think not so much the logistics of how do you structure your day, like that's important, but really everybody should dig into their story. Everybody should dig into where they've come from. And, uh, you know, everybody carries some kind of trauma, some kind of hurt, some kind of negative disempowering stuff in their life that, um, when it gets activated and you might not even know when it's getting activated, it, it flows into your business yeah. and, and your life and your parenting and your friendships. So, you know, when you're transitioning, right, somebody that's ready to transition, that's worth just taking some time to, to really go through. It's like, why, why are you doing this? You know, you're trying to prove something to somebody you're here to serve people, mm-hmm. you know, you're trying to be less hurt versus more healed. Those are two totally different things. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Intentional is a powerful word. You've used it a number of times. It's an underused word because when you use it, you have to follow through with it because when you think it, you can't think intentional and go the other way or else you're a coward, I would suggest to you. Right. So intentional is a really powerful word and I'm really glad you brought it up a number of times because if you're not intentional, so I, I share, I share that back to you, Matt, because I believe in this concept you know, so I've had success, this business athlete success through structure, accountability systems. And part of that is, is what I call my life tasks. So my, my life tasks are taking care of Keith first, taking care of Lauren, taking care of my kids, taking care of my circle, 
And then everything else happens after that. It's taken me some journey in my life to figure that out. And, and I'll be frank, that sometimes I'm not very good at it. Hence my intentional communication with my family to say, hey, okay, guys, here's what the week looks like. Here's what the month looks like. Here's what the next little while looks like. Dad's busy for a while, but it's being intentional and communicating. But those life tasks, Matt, most important on, on a daily basis. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and however you... Um, however you structure those, right. And schedule yes. those. I mean, some people like I am very intentional and structured with the calendar. Like this is my time. This is workout. This yes. is faith time, you know, things like that. And then I, you still don't execute on that perfectly. I'm like, how did, how did today end up like this? Because it was supposed to be like this. Yeah. And then yes. the fires come, right. The emergencies come. Uh, but yeah, no, that, that intention is, is walking into, you know, you talked about, you can't just wake up, roll out of bed, not know what's going to happen that day. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, I get up. What do I want to accomplish? Who do I want to accomplish it for? What's what's the outcome? You know, I know like I know a lot of families, they spend a lot of time together, but they all sit there and they're on their phones, like they're watching TV while they're on their phones. Nobody's engaging. They're like, we spent time together. Like you didn't spend any time together. You were all off in your own little worlds. Like I'd much rather have 30 minutes of just an intentional phones off conversation with Emily and the kids to see how how their days were. Mm -hmm. A little little debrief of the day. We love doing that every day. Mm -hmm. Matt, you've spoken about being a man of faith a few times on this yeah. show. Um, what does that mean to you? Yeah, so I follow Jesus. I believe his story is true and that what he said is true. And that's what I'm betting my life on and um, use him as the example to follow. And um, wasn't always like that. So I got, I got uh, picked up out of a field. I was almost dead when I was 19. I was on tons of drugs, tons of alcohol. That had been my, my story going on for, for a decent amount of time there. And I got picked up by a police officer. And the, the long story short with that is um, he had two options of what to do with me that night. He first was like, okay, is this kid going to die? I think he's okay still. And he's like, do you want to go to the drunk tank or do you want to go home? I'm like, I want to go to the drunk tank. He's like, well, then you need to tell me how to get home. So I told him, I still knew where I, where I lived and he took me home. And at first he was very condescending, very judgmental, very stereotypical police talk and and attitude right casting judgment on me and then um, he takes me out of the car walks me up to the door and he says hey matt like the reason i was so pissed and angry and upset with you because he was letting me have it in the car about why i shouldn't have been doing what i was doing he walks me up to the door and he's like hey you know the reason i was so upset is because i came from another department in a bigger kind of metropolitan city and there was a, a kid that really reminded me of of you and we picked him up he was doing the same thing you were doing and instead of taking him home, you know, we took him to the drunk tank, which turned to the hospital, which turned to the morgue. And then I had to go drive and tell his parents, you know, that their son's not coming home. So he, he totally changed his tune and began to show me just grace and love and forgiveness. He didn't quote a Bible verse, like he didn't pull out John 316 or slap me with a Bible or anything like that. He just, just human to human, man to man, showed me some love and, and compassion and some grace like he had all the control and authority to like take me to jail and punish me and um so i go home and i wake up the next day and i'm and i'm sitting there thinking about this and i i had been presented with the story of jesus a lot of different ways from a lot of different people who followed him yeah. but they they followed him in very interesting ways um and i mean i was i was so turned off by a lot of that and again i'm angry i've still got my own stuff going on so I was like, I was looking for the, for the bug in the weeds per se, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm looking for them to fail at, at, at being perfect and everything. So I, I just said, Hey, at this point, like I've got to decide if this story is true. And I read a couple of books written by Lee Strobel. He was a journalist who went out to disprove the story of Jesus. Uh, and then he concluded after like two years of research, he quit his job and went on this two year hunt to disprove this story that that the story is true. And I go, Hey, at this point, I've got to make a yes or no decision. And, and then I did. So, I mean, I'm 19 years old and that's when I turned my life over to Christ and um, that journey, man, that's been a, just a crazy journey of, of imperfection and improvement, people pouring into me. And I would share though, you know, that I hadn't really been super bold in my faith. I wouldn't have jumped on your podcast last year and told you that story. Cause I, cause I felt like it had to be separate. Like I had to compartmentalize it from from business and everything else that that is a part of my life, um, yeah. So I've just been I've just been boldly sharing my story and my faith, and it's been it's been really cool. 
So I just got goosebumps. I, I have goosebump moments throughout these shows. And I just had another moment with you or with this guest to my audience who are watching or listening. And I'm just kind of rivaling some emotion right now. Um, I need to pause. So a year ago, you would not have shared that. So I want to thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that. No, and I'm, and I'm not saying that to, 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 yeah. to make a crack out of you or to, or to, or to, make, to, to make light of it. I'm saying it because um, it, it's been a, it was a thing for you up until even a year ago. So there's people listening right now that have their thing that they're struggling with. And there's a yeah. process that we go through to become, to gain the confidence to speak about that thing. You see, you know what I'm getting at, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, and and everybody's got that. Yeah. And and for me, it was just you know I could I, I was bold in my business story and, and yes. my fatherhood story and my man. And then somebody's like, well, "What about this over here?" They're like, "Aren't you a Aren't you a Christian?" I saw like I saw you at church. What do you like? If I like, mean, your, your identity, isn't it? It's part of your identity. Yeah. And you're like, well, "Wait yeah. a minute, I'm not really yeah. true to my identity if I'm not including this part of it." You know, and and for me, it was, and I think it was a. Mm, maybe a cop out if I want to say it that way is, you know, I don't need to, I don't need to say like, I'm going to come on your podcast and I'm going to be kind and I'm going to be loving and I'm going to be compassionate. And then you're just going to know that, that I follow Jesus. Right. I don't need to say it. I don't need to lead with it. Mm. Right. Um, and, and I just thought that was the case for, for a long time. And, and it wasn't, I go, I'm missing, I'm missing opportunities to, uh, to share that with, with people. And it's been really cool just because I get to speak to a lot of men. I get to a lot, uh, speak to a lot of men that have, that have found their faith, but then also guys that are circling, like right outside that edge, they were circling right where I was, you know, right. As I'm doing all these drugs and alcohol and chasing the women and getting messed up, like to the point mm -hmm. I should have been dead every weekend in college mm -hmm. for an entire year. I don't know how I was alive the next day after these nights. And there were just these people in my life that, you know, they weren't judging me. They were just, Hey Matt, you should check this out. Come have a coffee, check this out. So um, I think not asking somebody a question that could help them make their decision about eternity is like, you can't not ask that question. You can't not have that conversation. Finding Jesus helped you find purpose, Matt Shope. Yeah. Would I be correct in that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. gave you gave you clear. You froze up there for a second, so it gave you clear purpose, didn't it? Yeah. yeah, it absolutely did. Yeah, it absolutely did. And then a year ago, um, then a year ago, that re that purpose was reignited mm -hmm. when the light went on, and you're like, no, I got to share this, and there's a way to share it in a way yeah. that people will embrace me and will embrace my message, and not look at me as the the stigma Christian guy. And I mean that with all respect, right? No, I'm serious though, right? No, no, man. I get, I get it because it was like, it's like, I don't, I don't want to come across. There was this, there was this guy in the dorms. Jay, don't, like I share. don't, I appreciate your genuine, your, 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 your authentic genuity about you. You don't. Right. Yeah, no. And it was just like, it was so funny because as, as I'm, as I'm just so close, like I'm so hammered every weekend. Right. And I'm coming back to the dorms. It's two in the morning and I'm drunk and I'm, and I'm hungry, you know? And I'm walking down the hall smelling Chipotle, like steaming out of the door of this door room. And then I hear the guitar music because it's this guy named Brad and he's got all his little friends. He's like in his cargo shorts and his wife beater and they're singing Jesus music, like having a Bible study. It's like, it's now Saturday morning, right? So Friday night's passed and it's two, three in the morning. And I'd, wa I'd walk down and I'm cursing and I gagged with this tonight. And I'd walk past the door and I'd always stop. He'd always look at me. I always look at him and he's like, hey, Matt, what are you, what are you doing? Are you drunk? Are you drunk again? And I'm like, yeah, what are you doing? Are you talking to Jesus or something like, well, what are you doing? And I'm like, did he offer me some Chipotle? Cause I was high and I was hungry. I could it no, no, like, like I'm being funny. Cause it's funny. And I think back and I'm getting to the point like, yeah, dude, no, he's judging me. I, I, yeah, I thought that was you. I could smell you coming down the hall. So every weekend I just, I would literally get more drunk and be more loud and more obnoxious and then he's putting it on and we're just you know button heads and i go hey like how cool of an opportunity would that have been for him to just invite me in for some chipotle and 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 just be kind right and just you know so i'm like man i just don't want to be that um but you can't take those experiences you can't take so so for your listeners right maybe you're about to step into something hey i'm going to be a business guy now 
and man, I've got all this fear because my uncle was this business guy. He was a really bad business guy. He did bad things. And you just, you carry this stigma from a, a negative event in your story and your past. And you just, and you don't want to become that. You just got to remember like that just, just cause it was him, just cause it was that doesn't, doesn't mean you're going to carry that um, business entrepreneurship. You really get to define what you and your company stand for. It's just an extension of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's taken me this show to regain my confidence that I've lost in, along the way here. So when you speak yeah. about coming out a year ago about, you know, uh, I'm a man of Christ, I follow Christianity and, and, and I'm okay with it. It's part of my identity. Um, it's a vulnerability that people want to hear about. And when they do, they want, they want to then follow that, right? So that's, that, that's, that's, that's again, back to that superpower that you have. So cracking a funny joke with you, Matt, before the show started, I said, Hey, we try to, you know, we try to do 45, 50, 52 minutes. And you're like, uh -huh. okay, well, if I'm at 25 minutes, I know we've sucked. Well, you can see the clock. Like I have, we've clearly been doing a hell of a job here. I having don't suck. <laughs> <laughs> so before we say, I don't want to say goodbye, but before we have to start wrapping up to saying goodbye, yeah. I, want, I want to throw a couple of things out on the table. So, you know, being, being a business athlete, you know, in, in, you know, includes that athletic, mental, emotional side of things. Yeah. Yeah. Brazilian jiu-jitsu, big part of yeah. your life. Big, big part of your life. Yeah. yeah, let's talk about that for a few moments for our audience. How has so, that influenced your personal, professional life? And how do you fit that in? It's, it, it's, sa it's saved my life. It sounds cliche, but mm -hmm. I think I would have seriously hurt somebody or hurt myself throughout my journey and story if it wasn't for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I, I would not be the man that I am um, on, on lots of different levels and lots of different domains. So be, because I was bullied as a kid, um, I, I vividly remember this, right? So I'm in 10th grade, I'm a little skinny, little skinny, lanky guy. And this girl walks up to me and she squeaks, she squeezes my arm and she's like, eh. And then she goes over to this big dude, squeezes his arm. He's standing, dude's jacked. She's like, this is what the girls are looking for. This, this is what your arm needs to look like. Like, I remember that. So I started lifting weights literally the next day. I'm like, where's your room? Take me to the gym. So I just start getting, you know, I start filling this void, lack of confidence with like getting bigger, the bigger muscles, the, the, the and people start looking at me. So like when I started doing that, people are, oh, hey, how's it going? Girls are saying hello. Um, but had absolutely no idea how to how to fight, how to defend myself. I was very lippy, very, very mouthy. So I'm college painting days. I'm out with the college painters drinking one night. We're in downtown Denver. There's like 20 of us. And, you know, a lot of us are kind of meat heady and we're drinking. We're very intoxicated. Four guys walk by. They say something. Um, I go, yeah, what are you going to do about it? There's 20 of us. There's four of you. And these four guys charge 20 of us. And then the 20 of us become two of us. Cause these guys got really big and they kicked the crap out of me. Like they, they put me in the hospital, messed me up. Fast forward three years after I meet Emily, I'm still, you know, still lifting the weights. Her dad, he's a Christian man of faith. He's a counselor. He's just the nicest, like biggest teddy bear you'll ever meet. And he goes, Hey Matt. So, um, yeah, have you ever, you know, you ever thought about martial arts? You know, I heard, I heard you got me got into a little bit of a rumble down in, down in Denver and, you know, maybe you should go check, check some things out. So I studied Krav Maga for, for four years. What he was effectively saying is like, hey, if you want to marry my daughter, you need to know how to, how to protect her, how to defend her. And, and I do this Israeli hand-to-hand -hand combat stuff, but there was nothing on the ground, right? There was, there was no groundwork. So we move and I'm driving by this jujitsu academy every day, going to continue to lift weights. And I'm like, I'm going to go in there and show everybody my striking skills. Like, oh, mixed martial arts. Yeah, I watched that on TV. Uh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in there. And, and so I roll in after a workout at the Gold's Gym. And I come in and there's not a kickboxing class. There's all these guys putting these pajama suits on and putting on their belts and roll, rolling around on the mats. I go, what is this? They go, oh, it's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And I said, oh, it sounds fun. What's the goal? <laughs> and this dude, he grabs me. He goes, oh, you're going to have fun, big guy. He's like, all you need to do is just go grab one of the guys out there and throw them to the ground, get on top of them. And then, you know, put a choke. You watch, you watch UFC on TV, right? Do a, do a choke or an arm lock. I go, okay, give me the big guy over there. They're like, no, 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 no. Go with Timmy over here. And Timmy's, you know, I'm, I'm 220 pounds of just meathead. I'm 27 years old. And they're like, go with Timmy. He's 14, 140 pounds. I'm like, sweet. You guys sure about this? I said, we're sure about this. <laughs> Timmy, is Timmy sure about this? Cause Timmy's going to get it. 
And I go up, I slap hands, bump knuckles, and you know, I go to grab Timmy. I come after this guy with all my might. He flips me over his head, jumps on my back, starts choking me, arm locking me, and I'm like tapping out left and right, um, getting humiliated on the mats. And this is my introduction to jujitsu, and um, I, I absolutely fell in love with it. It uh, was like the absolute essence of somebody with the proper leverage, timing, mm -hmm. technique, execution. He, he didn't have another hundred pounds. He didn't have it. So he wasn't going to try to out muscle me. He just used it when it, when it was effective, used my strength against me. And that's literally just how business and leadership works, right? It's like you, you have what you have when you're going to make this transition, start this business and you use it the right time, the right technique in the right amount. It can, it can become your greatest asset. Um, but yeah, I was super pissed when I left that day because like, I'm like, how does this little kid do this to me? I want to learn how to do this to somebody else. And that's initially why I kept coming back. But, you know, throughout, throughout my journey, as I've gained more skills, I started competing. I started teaching kids, especially I'm like, this is not what jujitsu is about. You know, having these tools, like it's the last, last thing I want to use. I've used it like three significant times outside the academy to, to legitimately defend myself and my family. Mm -hmm. And each time I've used it, it's been at a higher level of training. And, and each time I've used it, it's been more contained. It's waited longer to come out until it really, really needed to. And it's, it's just a beautiful thing. So, you know, when I teach kids now at the academy, I'm like, you guys are going to face what I faced as a kid. Like bullying is not going to go away, but you're going to have all these different tools that I never had. Um, and, and it's just, it's a beautiful thing. Okay, so my audience is going to want me to ask this question. If I don't ask it, they're going to say, Keith, why don't you ask the question? So we may have to go into a little bit of overtime here on my friend that I know what the clock, is, what the clock is. So no, I'm good, man. Uh, you had to use the jujitsu out of the studio yeah. three times. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm listening. Yeah, I mean, the, mo the most significant time was uh, just recently. I was over in Spain with my daughter, and we were at the Seville Fair. So like Seville... Uh, it's my favorite, like one of my favorite cities on the planet. I have the Bell Tower of Seville tattooed here on my on my Very arm. Cool. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But like, I I, lo I love it over there. And they have this annual fair. It's called the Feria. So you think of like the county fairgrounds. You got Ferris wheels and food and all this stuff. I mean, they have literally square miles of this area on the west side of the river that they they turn into these little tents. They're called casetas, and you dress up in a suit, the girls dress up in flamenco dresses, you drive a horse and carriage into this thing and get dropped off. It's beautiful. And this is the second year that I'd taken my daughter to this. And um, we're out and we're coming home back to a taxi. It's relatively early by Spain standards. It's one in the morning and everybody's lined up in the taxi line. So we get in line and we make sure we're the last people in line and people start lining up behind us, like pretty, pretty standard. Taxis are pulling up, picking up people, driving off. So taxi pulls up to pick up these, these ladies, these older ladies. And they're like, we're waiting for a friend. You guys can go ahead. So we go ahead. And then they're like, no, 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 never mind. Our friends here will catch the taxi. So they jump in the taxi and take off. So we're already kind of stepped out of the line. Next taxi pulls up. I go to open the door and all of a sudden, like five, six people behind us start screaming at us. And they're like, no, no, F you, you can't get in there. And, and then they start screaming like racial slurs. Like there's all these fun things you can call like a big, tall, white foreigner over there. So like we're, we're catching all this stuff. And I'm like, guys, like you're drunk. We're getting in the taxi. Haley gets in the taxi. She's already in there. And I go to get in and I literally feel a guy. He, he runs up, he grabs the door and rips it open. And I turn around and he's holding the door. He's staring me right in the face. And then he grabs me by the wrist. And I'm like, and I speak fluent Spanish, right? So I'm like, hey, bro. And he's like, you effing white. He's calling me Polish. He thought I was Polish, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not Polish, dude. But anyway, let go of me. And I circle out and he grabs me again. So I circle out and then I give him a little push. And, and this all happened pretty quickly. Um, you know, the push turned into he keeps grabbing me. And um, then I pushed him into some of the other people that were in the crowd. And then these people started antagonizing him. So instead of coming back and grabbing me at this point, he dives into the taxi and tries to grab Haley. And she's, she's 12. And um, she's trained. <laughs> she, Haley's okay. Haley's trained jujitsu since she was four, right? So she's in there all dressed up in her <laughs> flamenco dress. And she's got the little wooden fan. And, and I mean, this guy dives in. I'm like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just choke the guy and pull him out of the taxi. And she hits him. She cracks him with the fan 
he backs out. I'm like, okay, like now, now we're fighting. Like now I, I have to physically do something to make a statement with this guy. Well, and yeah. he, he grabbed me again and I, I spun him around and just twisted his arm in ways it shouldn't have been twisted. And he had to go get an x-ray after that, like, like a pretty serious one. Cause it was just uh, the, the beauty in the situation was like, Hey, conversation, no setting boundaries. No, no, no. Okay. Starts to get physical. I don't need to go smash the guy in the face and put his nose into his brain. It was like, dude, just, just stop, just stop, just stop. But then it's finally, okay, there's a point here where I, I have to escalate this thing to a point where it's making a statement because other people are now approaching the taxi rallying around this guy. You know, we're the big foreigners, whatever that cut them off and stole their taxi. And it's funny because there's like four taxis pulling up behind while this is all happening. I'm like, go get the other taxi. Um, but yeah, it was one of those things where like my daughter could have been seriously injured. That taxi yeah. could have dri driven off and I could have been in a lot of trouble. Like jujitsu is not going to work against eight drunk people of course. beating on me. Um, yeah. So, you know, snap the guy's arm up and elbow and whatever, whatever else pushed him away, got in the taxi. We drove off and Haley's like, holy cow. She's like, good job, dad. She goes, I smacked that. <laughs> and it wasn't like it wasn't. I mean, she trains this every day. She's here yeah. at the academy three, four days a week training, you know, what if somebody grabs you? What if somebody grabs you? And it's just this repetitive thing. She thought it was kind of, she goes, I smacked the crap out of that guy. He tried to grab me. I'm like, that's what you do. Matt, you really are a superhero. And I mean that I'm serious. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. Uh, Matt. So listen, um, what did I, I need something from you? Yeah. You're a successful entrepreneur. You're a successful man. You're a successful father. What advice do you have for business leaders, retired athletes who are looking for their next and seeking yeah. to make that positive impact on their mm -hmm. communities and the world? Mm -hmm. Yeah. First thing I'd say is in my transitions, because I have multiple businesses and I'm transitioning out of things that I've known that have been part of my identity that give me certainty, security into this unknown space. And it's in, enjoy that space that you're in. So enjoy the transition. I see too many people that rush into something because they feel like they have to fill that void or fill that gap. So just enjoy it. Just enjoy it and say, I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, you may, <clears throat> if you have the benefit of financial runway because of the transition, then, then that gives you more space. And some people, some people don't, but like, even if you don't still, still enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Um, I interviewed a football player. He was a professional football player. And I mean, when he made that transition, he said that was really, really difficult for him. But he's like, you know, I, I leaned into just knowing that I was in a transition. The, the next thing is like, go back to, you know, go back to dreaming it like you were when you were a little kid, you know, because you may have found this career, this business that you sold, whatever it is that you maybe stumbled into or wasn't your calling. And it's just what kind of pulled you in. But just take in this space, you know, take some time to say, what, like, what does life look like? What is, what is the vision? What did I want to do when I was a kid? What are some other passions and some other, other interests and hobbies that I, that I have? Um, and then when you go, okay, I think, I think it's this, I think it's business, go out and take people to coffee, lunch, dinner, what breakfast, whatever, go interview people and go spend time with people that are in that space that you are looking to get into. Um, and then you've got to, You've got to make that commitment. So this photographer I talked about, the police officer photographer, I'm like, dude, even when you replace your income, you're wired so much that even when it's replaced, you won't jump. So you mentioned Kobe, right? Like there's all these personality type surveys. I'm very uh, deeply involved with DISC and human motivators index, but go take a free or a low cost personality survey to understand how you're going to make these decisions about the transition reach out to people and then you've, you've got to make that that commitment date of what you're going to do and then when you make that transition and i've learned this a lot is um, be patient good things take time uh you know there, there's these flat i had a flash in the pan business success right my business grew really quickly um but to have longevity and to have something that really builds over time you got to give something a decade yes and, and we're too short-sighted because of all the crap on social media, you know, it's like, Hey, I did this and I got this many, I own this much real estate in 22 months. And I did it with everybody. I like, and just everything that's out there, whatever it is, I'm not knocking the real estate guys, whatever the, the stuff is. It's like, no, it took, it took 20, this is like a 20 year journey, 30 year journey 
you know, and no, nobody sees the 30 years before they just start hearing about it when it's all said and done. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matt Shelp, yeah. now over the hour together, I have not given you the opportunity at all to talk about Painted Baby, become an award winning company, uh, any of the speaking tours that you do, and the books, and all the other successful things that you do. So at this point, as we say goodbye in a few moments, I'd like you to take a, an opportunity to, to plug what you want to plug. Make sure the audience knows how they can find you, what they yeah, can get yeah. from you, et cetera, et cetera. No, I really appreciate you for, for letting me do that. I, you know what I would tell everybody is if uh, you go to my website, mattshout.com, what I tell everybody to do is grab the free tools and, and resources, right? So I've got some really cool leadership and business resources, a free business video coaching program the personality survey called a leadership language survey. And that just kind of gets you into my world and, and community. So, uh, you know, I write a, a weekly blog. Uh, I have a weekly podcast where I have some awesome, amazing guests here in studio. So like if you're ever in Colorado, in the Denver area, you've got, yeah. you've got to come out, we'll jam on some coffee 100%. And, and hang on on the podcast. Um, but then, you know, from there, yeah, go buy one of my books. I wrote a book called Become an Award-Winning Company. It's uh, seven steps on how to win business awards and then leverage them to, to get some really good free PR and advertising exposure. And then uh, Painted Baby is all about how you put aside your shiny marketing, A plus five-star brochure of yourself, and you just share a moment where you screwed something up and you're really vulnerable and brave about some of your imperfections. And that's actually going to connect you deeper to people and they're going to trust you more and then they're going to do more business with you, right? But um, that book is a real over-encompassing book for just connecting with people in, in life in general. And then, you know, so that's kind of the the $20 entry point to get into my world. And then I've got some video coaching programs about marketing mastery, time management. You can see it all on the website. The, the big thing I do, though, is either coming out to do, you know, keynotes for business leadership conferences. And then I'm also taking uh, people to Spain on adventures and experiences. So we have a father-son hike of a lifetime, June of 2024. So I'm taking a small group of fathers and sons to go hike 70 miles over six days. And and uh, really go just unplug so you can bond and connect deep with uh, with your kiddos. That's exceptional. Matt Shelp, thanks for joining us, you know, joining us all here in the lab today. Will you come back? Absolutely. Yes. Anytime. We got we to hang more. We'll, we'll do round two, round three. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if I can just throw you into the green room for a quick second, and uh, I'm going to say goodbye to the audience and come back because I knew you got to get out of here too in a few minutes. So awesome. um, we're going to say goodbye to Matt and throw him off off to you, uh, the green room there in a second. Going to do that there and bring over me here. That was a good show. Uh, Matt's going to put the old M&M peanuts away for November. I'm putting the peanut butter away, continued for November. I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation with Matt. You can find him at mattshelp.com. I'm in a rush. You know why I'm in a rush? Because Matt only has a few minutes. I want to go say a few things to him off the air. So we're wrapping up today's show. We're back tomorrow with another Matt. Another Matt. Matt Rouse joins us tomorrow, live in the lab, noon central time. Not minus five GMT. No, no, no. It's minus six GMT. I'm Keith. I'm Keith Billis. I'm out of here. I'm live in the lab. Yeah, once I figure out how to turn the button off again, there we go right there.